Hey, I'm Dr. Rob. Welcome to Biblical Genetics. I'm coming to you today from the shore of the Chattahoochee River uh, near Atlanta. I had a rare free day, so I came to Atlanta to do some shopping. And while I'm here, I'm like, I got to film. So I found this park that I've actually never been to. I've tubed down the Chattahoochee upstream from here a little bit, but I've never actually stood on the shore of the river like this. And from here on out, I'm speaking without any notes because my notes just fell into the river. Apparently the wind has picked up a bit. It was a nice warm day and the clouds are coming in, the weather's changing. In fact, I'm regretting not wearing my jacket right now. But it's in the 50s still. It's a typical Atlanta November day, bright and brisk. And I'm outside and I'm enjoying being outside because as you notice from my videos, I tend to film next to rivers or mountains or in the woods because that's the places where I like to go and I like to share that with you. But back to the story. Now I want to share with you some of my thoughts on a new project that I've been working on. It's actually in response to a challenge from an evolutionist, a, a well-known skeptic who jumps on me frequently. Um, but basically it's people claiming that you cannot measure mutation rates today and use that to say how long ago mitochondria leave and or, or how long ago uh, Y chromosome atom lived. You silly creationist, that's not the way it works. You have to use a phylogenetic rate, which is performed by assuming a common ancestry between two species, like say humans and chimpanzees, counting up the number of differences between say the Y chromosome or the mitochondrial genome, and then dividing by the time. And so if we separated 6.5 million years ago, allowing a little time for lineage sorting, maybe 7 million years ago between the last common ancestor, you take the number of differences divided by 7 million, you get a very slow mutation rate. It's called the phylogenetic rate. It's usually on the order of 10 to the negative eight, that's one out of 100 million, mutations per year, per nucleotide. So any given nucleotide, you'd expect it to mutate once every 100 million years. That's a slow rate. Well, I like to talk about uh, mutation rates in terms of uh, generations, as in the number of mutations themselves per generation, not the rate at which the letters change. And that gives you, oh, one mutation every 2,000 generations, 3,000 generations. I don't remember what the exact number is, but it's very slow rate of change, extremely slow rate of change. And that's the number an evolutionist is gonna quote. That 10 to the negative eight translates into, you know, all humans picking up one mutation in common every few thousand years. Oh, wait a minute. That's different, isn't it? That's how fast the species as a whole changes. But the mitochondrial leave and the Y chromosome atom argument isn't that. It's how fast do mutations build up in the population? That's a different question. It's not how fast the species changes, how fast do the people in the species diverge from one another. There's no substitution in Y chromosome atom. There's no substitution with this mitochondrial Eve hypothesis is everybody's different. Not everybody is the same. It's how fast we're separating. And you can definitely use the genealogical mutation rate to estimate that. And when you do, you get a mitochondrial Eve a few thousand years ago, not a few hundred thousand years ago. You get a Y chromosome atom only a few thousand years ago, not a few hundred thousand years ago. If you use the evolutionary rate, yes, you get one that's very far back in time and it's not a biblical date and it actually would contradict the Bible if you do that. But in order to use that rate, you have to assume evolution is true. You have to assume humans and chimpanzees have a common ancestor, but we're arguing that humans and chimpanzees don't have a common ancestor. So if you're using the evolutionary number, you're actually using a circular argument because the question is, do we have a common ancestor? You can't assume it and then use that in a number. So let's talk about the genealogical rate, the rate we can measure, and the reason why evolutionists will reject that number. There's two reasons why they'd say this number doesn't apply. One is natural selection. They would say, well, selection is going to remove most mutations. Okay, but in neutral theory, which is a very popular theory amongst evolutionists, most mutations are neutral. In fact, most mutations have to be neutral it doesn't mean that evolution happens on neutral means. You can still have selection. You can still be a selectionist, but most mutations have to be neutral because humans pick up a lot of mutations per generation. Clearly, most of them don't have a large effect or we'd all be dead already. Humans, uh, dogs, pigeons, um, and you name a species, especially multicellular species, especially mammals, they pick up way too many mutations per generation. They'd all be extinct by now if most mutations weren't neutral. So the question is, 
how many mutations can natural selection actually remove? And that is a matter of how many mutations directly affect the organism. How many of them are selectable, not neutral or not selectively neutral? In other words, a mutation that's irrelevant, you know, a mutation to the third letter in the codon or in some place in a, a non-coding region that doesn't affect anything in the organism. It's just a spacer region or something like that. There's plenty of places where you can mutate things. You can even change amino acids and proteins and they have almost no effect. Okay, that means that most mutations are neutral, meaning the genealogical mutation rate equals the long-term accumulation rate. In fact, according to standard population genetics theory that you'll learn in any population genetics class, any introduction to population genetics textbook like Harder Lynn Clark's famous book that I used in my graduate study work, they will say that the rate of fixation or substitution of neutral mutations in a population equals the neutral mutation rate. So if you have a mutation rate of one per generation and you have like a million individuals, well, that whole population is going to be substituting one letter in this genome every generation because of neutral mutations. So the neutral mutation rate equals the fixation rate of neutral mutations. Okay. But what about selectable mutations? Well, we can model that. And that's where Mendel's accountant comes in. Now, if you say, oh, a modeling, no, garbage in, garbage out, or the model is only good as the modeler, or something like that, one of those buzz phrases you hear a lot. No, hold a second. Modeling is a very important factor in modern science. And when you have a theory, say, genetic entropy, and you have a model, say, Mendel's accountant, and then you find real world data that supports your model and your theory, that three-legged stool, that trifecta is a powerful argument. And indeed, we have this idea that most mutations are selectively neutral. And then we can model that, and Mendel's accountant has been very robustly studied. It's been uh, the, the generator of multiple scientific papers. I summarize this in an article on creation.com called A Successful Decade for Mendel's Accountant, which you can look up on creation.com, where I just, I, I listed all the things that have been done with this and all the amazing arguments for the creation side of the equation that Mendel's accountant has brought forth for us. Okay, so I took Mendel's accountant and I ran a lot of models. And I just did a generic model of humans over a long period of time, 300,000 years or, or 100,000 generations. And I said, here's a mutation rate. And I had all these different levels of um, uh, neutral to non-neutral mutations from zero to 100% on, on both of them. And I looked at how the mutations accumulated over time. And clearly the neutral mutations accumulate like a clock. They are not affected by selection and they're not affected by the other thing that the evolution is going to throw in your face, genetic drift. And because of that, we can use the neutral mutation rate to estimate how fast mutations build up and how fast the population will change. And since most mutations are neutral, sorry, Mr. Evolutionist, um, the, the clock that we see in families should apply over the long term. But selection does remove some mutations. This is true. I mean, in fact, um, selection removes most of the bad mutations right away because the child that picks up a mutation that kills it in the womb, well, it doesn't grow up to be studied in a genetic study when it's an adult. If someone has a metabolic deficiency from a, a mitochondrial disease, well, they might not make it to adulthood. So we already see a lot of weeding out of a lot of bad mutations. And what we're talking about now is only the mutations that are survivable that can be passed from parent to child or from great, great granddaddy to a couple great, great grandchildren that we can go and sequence and count up the number of generations and the number of mutations that separate them. So there's already a selective filter here, but selection will still remove some of the remaining variants. But the number is not that large because selection has a limit. You can't select all the mutations, you'll drive your population extinct. For selection to work, you've got to winnow out individuals. There's only so much reproductive potential for any population. This is Walter Remind's work, um, which I'll have linked in the show notes also. And there is a cost to selection. So if you want selection to remove mutations, fine, you can do so. But most mutations are neutral. And of the ones that aren't, you have a limit to how many you can remove. And in the end, all the modeling that I showed, uh, all the modeling that I did, showed that mutations will build up regardless of selection. But we already kind of knew that. So the second argument 
that the evolutionists might throw in your face if you try to bring this up is, oh no, genetic drift is going to use, is going to remove most mutations. But if they say that, they actually don't understand population genetics. It's really funny when they say it because I understand at least this aspect of it. It is true that most mutations are lost over time. That is true. Uh, Roop and Sanford in their ICC paper a couple years ago showed that something like 99.99% of all new mutations are lost to drift quickly in a population. Well, if that's true, doesn't that mean that most of the genealogical mutations are going to be lost? No, because, yeah, I got half of the DNA that my father had, he passed to me. So I only got half of the mutations that he picked up. And I got half the mutations that my mom picked up. Well, doesn't it look like the, the mutations get divided in half every generation? And if each couple on average has two children, well, that means that about 25% of the mutations in each parent is going to be lost. And then they, that mutation might not be passed to the grandkids or the great grandkids, the great great grandkids. Kids, most mutations will be lost quickly. But you have two parents. If both of your parents passes you half of the mutations that they carry, well, two times one half equals one. The number of mutations you inherited from them equals the mutation rate. Oh, you have four grandparents. That's 25% of their mutations you got. Yeah, but you have four grandparents. 25% times four equals one. You have eight great grandparents. One eighth times eight equals one. The mutation burden you carry equals the mutation rate of the population. This is inescapable. So even though any given mutation has a really high probability of being lost, there are so many mutations floating around that drift cannot remove them all. In fact, the accumulation rate of mutations equals, once again, the mutation rate. So selection doesn't remove them and drift doesn't fix the problem. And yet it's funny because when we're talking about why chromosome atom and mitochondria leave, we're not talking about the substitution rate, how fast a whole species change. We're talking about how fast the species diverges. How fast mutations build up in the population, not how fast mutations get fixed in the population. And when you just use the molecular clock that we can use from Y chromosomes or mitochondria that we can measure in families, Y chromosome atom, mitochondria leave are literally just a short time ago. And yet, I don't even agree with a molecular clock. There's tons of studies that show that mutations don't accumulate at the same rate in all populations. In fact, population size has a huge effect on the mutation accumulation rate and the fixation rate. Uh, when you have a large population, you can harbor a lot of mutations, but you don't get substitution. You don't get change because it's almost impossible to have one person who becomes the ancestor of everyone in the population at some future point in time. Now it does happen, but really slowly. In small populations, you can get a lot of fixation, a lot of substitution, a lot of rapid turnover and change, but you also get less genetic diversity because more mutations are lost. So you have this balance between how fast you want to change, how much diversity you need, and also um, how fast you want to go extinct. Because in my population models, I showed that the smallest populations, even though they have the highest rate of fixation, also tend to go extinct. And a lot of my populations that went extinct in the model were building up simply too many mutations. And it's just funny that way, that there's this, this point counterpoint and there's this balance. So. The next time you hear an evolutionist try to tell you that you can't use a genealogical mutation rate, you can tell them that they have no basis for saying that. The genealogical mutation rate, the mutation rate we can measure, that we, we know it, it's not an approximation or it's approximation, it's not an assumption. We can measure, we have a pretty good idea, at least with an order of magnitude, how fast these mutations occur. And because they occur much too quickly for the evolutionist, that means that mitochondria leave, Y chromosome atom, are recent. That's all I wanted to say. I'm about to send my paper in. I'm looking forward to presenting at it next summer. You can uh, find information, just Google the International Conference of Creationism and it'll come right up and you can look at uh, where the conference is and how much it costs and how to get there and anything like that. I'll be there. A lot of people I know are going to be there. I can't wait. I'm really looking forward to it. And by the way, thank you to all my supporters. Uh, for your generous contributions. You're keeping biblical genetics on the air. You're also encouraging me to keep on making more videos. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to help contribute, just go to buymeacoffee.com or patreon.com. There'll be links in the show notes again. Or go to biblicalgenetics.com and you can find um, show notes for this episode and every other episode I've done, as well as links to the donation page. You all have a wonderful day. 
Enjoy God's creation. Don't run away from the skeptics and the antagonists. There are answers, but sometimes they just throw things in your face that they know that you can't answer and they do it on purpose. But very often, more frequently than you might even think, they know that they're actually uh, throwing a very weak argument in your face and they're hoping that you're not going to actually check the numbers like I just did.